Well, good morning, church. Morning. It's a great day to, uh, to gather together to worship, to begin uh, uh, the series here as we uh, roll into our, our new year, 2020, and, uh, and seeing it all from the start, Genesis uh, chapter 1. I want to encourage you, uh, in these 11 weeks that we're going to be in Genesis, uh, I want to encourage you to, to dive into to Genesis, to, to reading it, or uh, Bible, the, the Bible app, the, the version is an excellent uh, app uh, to take part in. There's, there's great devotionals in there, but you can also, like if you're just cruising and driving instead of talk radio that might anger you or, or music that might, you know, make you nostalgic or just sing along, just, man, put, put that on and let, let the Bible app read to you uh, and just, just tune in to what God has for us as we kick off 2020, as we look at, at this story in Genesis that is far too big for us to even come close to comprehending. All of us in this room could take the next 11 weeks and dive into all that we know, and it would just be not even on the, on the percentage scale uh, of the bigness to take all that in. So as we look at what we're doing this time in Genesis, because you could go on 50,000 uh, tracks on, on studying Genesis, really, and, and not get bored, but... Uh, uh, we're we're going to dive in and look at the person of Jesus Christ uh, from the beginning. And you know, every great story has a great start, and this is the story of Jesus from the from our our really our beginning, really from before the start. As we're going to see at different points, uh, Genesis one one in the beginning, God. Like right there, we could spend a month, right? And, uh, it unfolds the story of our time in the beginning, but, but as we see, even in John 1.1 1, 1, in different places in, in the Bible, Jesus was already there. So in, it, it could be in our beginning, God, because he was already there. I mean, just think of the phrase pre-existent Trinity God. You don't even, we don't even know what to do with that. This creative God who wanted to, to make something glorious, to display his glory. And so he said in his perfect trinity, the best way for us to express our glory is to create the universe. All that is out there. This loving God who wanted to make a specific part of creation that would be the recipient of his love. So not only the universe to display his glory, but then mankind where he could pour his love into one specific part of his creation. This spectacular God who wanted to make something that would best reflect his triune nature, the Trinity God. So in the beginning, Father, Son, Spirit, and he says, I'm going to make one part of my creation to, to best express all three of us. It's crazy. And this perfectly relationally intact God, because the Father, Son, and Spirit were not bored with each other, and they did not need more. They were forever, so timeline forever back, they were in perfect relationship. They didn't need anything. And this perfectly relationally intact God wanted to create unity and community because he knows that's when it's best for us. So he creates us so that we can be in unity and community with one another because he knows that's when, that's when they're going to be the most fulfilled. Genesis is a book about God's faithfulness to wayward people, as we're going to see as we, as we journey through this one. And the big idea of seeing it from the start in what we're doing in Genesis is that God blesses humanity. That's what you're going to see over and over and over in the book and then throughout scripture, and if you follow Jesus, you will, you will exist in that, that God blesses humanity. It's the same throughout the, the book of Genesis and through the course of history. This redeeming God who acts to restore his broken creation to something even better than it was before. If you read the, the end of the book, Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. So he makes perfect creation, and then later on he says, I'm going to make perfect creation better. Uh, again, we can't comprehend that. Much is unknown and mysterious about the, the book of Genesis. We don't know everything in its fullness, but we have enough, and it'll keep us busy until we no longer breathe on planet Earth, and we can ask all those questions later 
uh, in eternity for those who follow Jesus. It's enough to keep our minds in this continual state of being blown. And that's a good place to be because then we realize it's so much more than about me. It is about my God. And the goal of this whole Genesis series that we're in is that we would see God's plan in creation and then in redemption because chapter 3 does happen, not today, next week. And that we learn to trust Him and His way. And that's, that's really the true definition of humility. I'm going to see it your way and I'm going to walk in your way. The, the greatest place of humility we can put ourselves in is it's not about me, it's about you and how you plan it. And so I'm going to see how it was from the beginning and then what you did to redeem everything and I'm going to walk in what you call us to. That's a humble person following God. Genesis puts God in the center of everything. He's the initiator, he's the controller, he's the designer. Life is all about him. God's on the scene first and then everything in human existence is, is pointing to him. He created it that way. He, he made it that way because that's what makes sense and is best for us, is that, is that it's all about him and what he makes and who he makes points to his glory and his grandeur. He's at the center and we're not. So, Father, as we dive in today and as we dive in over the next 11 weeks and really we just live our life diving into Scripture and as we do that, Help us to see all that you have for us in, in the big picture and help us to understand your call on our individual lives. Jesus, this story is all about you because everything's all about you. And I pray that we would be more convinced and excited and, 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 and fulfilled by, by walking in that. And Holy Spirit, as you speak to us today, help us to hear you and to respond to you, whatever it is whether you're asking us to do something new or challenging us to, in, in an area, or convicting us of sin or encouraging our hearts, help us to hear from you and respond. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the book of Colossians, as Paul writes it, it tells us that, that Jesus was there from before the beginning and that all things were created through him and, and for him. I mean, that's what Colossians, he says it was created through Jesus and for Jesus. That's creation. In Genesis 1, we see Jesus creating this world. You're immediately confronted with the awesome glory, the awesome power, the awesome wisdom, the awesome love of Jesus to create this world that we're blessed to live in. There is so much to be blessed by. And I get there smog at times, and, and, and there's too much, it's too hot sometimes, and too cold sometimes, and all that. And part of that is, is because sin happened. And, but this place is amazing. It is spectacular. It is glorious. It's a blessing. And if it is not done absolutely perfect, boom, we're just a, 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 an explosion of gas uh, in the universe. So he, he, he created it very intricately and keeps it together. God had a plan, and it was good. He created perfect, because that's all God can do. Only thing he can do is perfect. Wouldn't that be a cool thing, if the only thing you can do is perfect? But you can follow the perfect one, believe in the perfect one, and have the perfect one living in you. So, man, what a good life we get. In looking at Genesis 1 and 2 today, my hope is that we would be awestruck at the intricate detail God went to in creation just because we're so loved. I mean, Genesis is this fascinating account from, from creation to these patriarchs we call Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to this, this man named Joseph who was this beautiful picture of, of, of Christ, this amazing man. He was a, a type of Christ. And, and that's really the story from, from in the beginning to the, the last breath of Joseph that we're covering. And, and so we'll be looking at uh, some events and, and then mostly some people and God's redemptive work in mankind as we cover Genesis. And as we walk through this book, we'll see a God who, who relentlessly pursues relationship with us and he loves us even when we blow it and we sin and we lie like we're going to read some of the stories. Who promises to rescue us from the curse that we put on ourselves through sin who makes a covenant with us to save us because we got things so messed up and we can't fix it. This God who's always loyal and faithful and gracious to us, 
who chooses not to just wipe the slate clean and start over on the, on the, on the other side of the universe, but, but he redeems all things through messy people. Here's the cool thing. He doesn't just redeem all things. He says, I'm going to redeem you, but I'm also going to use you for redemption. He redeems all things through messy people whom he purposely pursues, knowing our mess. And he shows his rescuing nature in stories that look like complete catastrophes, yet God. All of our lives, for those who follow Jesus, who believe in him, we all have a yet God story. And, and maybe it was you were doing really well on your own and, and you didn't know you were full of yourself, yet God came along and rescued you. Maybe it was your story is, is it was deep in this mud pit, yet God. So as we look at the story of Genesis, it, it kind of has three acts, three parts. There's act one, creation. Act two, the fall of mankind. And then act three, redeeming grace, which carries through even to this day. And if we wake up tomorrow, it'll, it'll carry through that redeeming grace story until we're all together worshiping around the throne forever. Crazy thought, too. Jesus the creator, Jesus the redeemer, Jesus the hope of all humanity. Jesus is the, the creative word that, that this God with really big hands, as he, as he created, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak the word, Jesus, and create the universe. I mean, just take that in. He spoke all things into existence. John, who was Jesus' best friend, John chapter 1, Verses 1 through 4, he wrote, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Jesus. And nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. So everyone's in darkness, and His life brought light. So as this story unfolds, we'll get, we'll get to see a God who clearly is at work in and through us in spite of ourselves. Because that's what God does. That's who He is. He moves in and He transforms His people who are chosen to, to receive His love and then, and then go out and declare His love and His grace to, to people who need that. Jesus is the promised one who was who was sent to us and sent for us, who would de defeat sin and Satan forever. He became one of us to save all of us. And it's wonderful to think that, that our Savior, if you're a follower of Jesus, your Savior is also your Creator. The one who saves you made you. So he's saving that which he loved making. He, he loved ha having a part in bringing you into existence. And so he loves saving you. He knows everything about me. I can get scary sometimes, but he does. He knows the purpose for your existence. You're like, I don't even know. He does. He understands how I function and operate. He knows how broken we actually are right now or at a, at a moment in the past when he saved us or what's going to come in the future. Jesus as Savior provides everything we need. Every need you have, Jesus as your Savior provides that. And so maybe somebody's here today and they've never made a decision to follow Jesus. You need saving. You've been created, you're here, so you exist. And if you don't follow Jesus as your, as your Lord and Savior, as your King, you need saving more than anything else on the planet. You might think you need something else, but the biggest need you have is to be saved. Because being saved by Jesus is an eternal thing. And the Bible tells us in, in Romans 10 that, that if you believe it in your heart and you confess it, you speak it out with your mouth, that He is who the Word of God says He is, the story of Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. If you believe that, even if you don't understand it all, because you're never going to, none of us will, you don't have to understand it all, but if you do not follow Him, You've never made that decision. The Bible says you can, you can call out to him and you'll be saved. Romans 10. All who call out to the Lord to be saved are saved. 
And so if you're here today and you've never made that decision to be saved, you can make that right now. Just right now where we are, where you are. Jesus, save me. Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I, I want to learn more. I don't understand it all, but, but I want to know it. You make that decision right now and you're saved by your creator to be, to be grown into an image of your creator and then forever with him. Because without salvation, it is forever without him when we stop breathing. But you can be saved today. And, and if you make that decision right now or you want to have somebody talk to you and pray, pray with you a, a little bit later, we would love to be a part of that, to pray with you, to bless you, to encourage you, to get a Bible in your hand, to, to get you involved in, in growing in Christ with others because we're created for community, which we'll see in a little bit here. God's created design. His mission has always been the same. It's never changed. He's intent on filling the earth with His glory. We read it throughout Scripture, especially you read it a lot in Isaiah. And then using His created image bearers, us, we're the image of God, to accomplish that goal. So He wants to declare His glory throughout the world and use us as, as, as created people that believe in Him and now follow Him to, to display His glory, to dispense His glory, to take His glory uh, out these doors and across this world. And our response to his unconditional love, to his relentless love of us, is to know him and then just make him known. It's easy to make known that which you know. <laughs> if I know God and I'm pursuing God, it's easy. He just comes out. If he's the number one thing I pursue, he's probably the number one thing I talk about. Know God and make him known because this world is dark and lost. So as we look at, at Genesis, as we look at the Bible, we look at the, the story of Jesus. Jesus starts it all. Jesus will finish it all one day. And in between, Jesus is the one holding it all together. That's verses 1 and 2, right? That's just crazy, right? I mean, we're not really kind of out of in the beginning God. There's just a lot. Now, you're not going to be here for four hours, so don't worry. Genesis 1.3 says this, Then God, he said, let there be light, and there was light. So this is a crazy one. Light, God brings light into darkness. It's a recurring theme throughout the Bible. We, we see it here. We see it all throughout the Bible. It begins here. God speaks, first of all, and chaos becomes order. God, God speaks, and light becomes, or dark becomes light. But here's the wild thing. Okay, Jesus is the light. We know that. But then God created light. But then three days later, he made the sun. I mean, that's a hard one. It's like, okay, Jesus is the light, so God didn't create the light in that verse 3. Or didn't create, it wasn't Jesus that he's talking about. He creates it. So Jesus is the light, but then light gets created. And then three days later, the sun, moon, and stars are created. I mean, that's a wild one, right? So we're looking at this, and it, there's a dark world and a chaotic world, and he speaks order into chaos and light into darkness. John 1, if you read the, the first half of, of John chapter 1, we see that Jesus is the light of the world. He's the one who, who reveals God to those that are stuck in darkness and brings that light to them. He moves in, he transforms people. It's amazing what Jesus does for us. Those who trust in Jesus are saved from darkness. Joy and peace and hope forever. And all during creation we see that, that God was happy with what he made and especially happy when he made us. Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us, again the Trinity God at work, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea. All the fishermen said, "Woo!" The birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Watch out, squirrel. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God created everything in creation. As you read the account, every time he does it and the day ends, it was good. But then when he 
when it comes to human beings, he amped it up a notch. Like God needed to trump himself, right? And it says it was very good because humans are an extra special part of creation in God's view. And he's the creator, so he gets to pick what matters and what happens. We're clearly ones who are created with this identity that is rooted in God, in his image, to be like the Trinity. We're designed to have this close, in-depth, one-on-one relationship with God through Jesus while having the spirit of the living God dwelling in us. So we're created in the image of God and we're created to have a close relationship with God. And then just take in the phrase, in the image of God. What does that even mean? The other day it was funny. Uh, I'm sometimes creeped out uh, about Siri and Google and Alexa and all them. Uh, I don't know, but I was in my office and I was writing stuff on my whiteboard and, and, I, and I said, what does that even mean? And I don't know what I had said before that, but all of a sudden my phone was like, I don't know, Scott. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, <laughs> creepy world. But it was right. We don't know. It's too big to comprehend in the image of God. You. You, when you look in the mirror, look at that person. I don't care what you think about yourself. You're in the image of God. How? I mean, we're talking about God. And we're not talking about just like Jesus. We're talking about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Each one of us is the image of the Trinity God. And an image is made to, to recall the original. Right? It's to remind us of, uh, you know, you make an image of someone, it's to, it's, to, it's to let somebody see it and remember the grandeur of that person or maybe that accomplishment. To show what the original looks like. I, see a, I know Wayne Davis and then I see a photo of Wayne Davis like during the week, I'm like, that's Wayne Davis. It's not actually Wayne, he's not this big in my pocket and this thin, but it's Wayne Davis because it's a picture of Wayne Davis. I know that. You are a picture of of the Trinity God. Now a lot of us are going, oh no, I have a lot of responsibility. Yeah, we do. But the cool thing is the Spirit of God lives in us to help us fulfill that responsibility. But when we live our lives every day, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, frustrated at this or that traffic or, or that checkout line or this you know, person, whatever it is, we're reflecting God. So how are you doing? I need God to help me reflect God, because I cannot do it on my own. Amen. An image is made, it's this, it's this duplicated memorial that pays homage to the deep meaning of the person. You have statues, we don't just have statues of, of no name and nobodies. No, nobody's a nobody, but historically, you know, it's people who did stuff, they make statues of them. Go all over Europe. There's just, it's like half the, half the continent is a statue, it seems like. They got a long history and they, they like making their statues, but they pay homage to someone. We are a walking homage to God. God made humans in his image so the world would be filled with reflectors of God. A billion statues of God walking around at any time so that nobody would miss the point of creation. Because really the point of creation is God. He's the point. He's the be all end all of this book. It is about him. And he says I'm making man so that people, man who doesn't know me yet, can see my glory. Because it's all about Jesus. He's the center of it all. The point of humanity is God. It's, it's knowing and loving and showing God. And God craves relationship with us. He says, it's not good that man should be alone. So his desire was that, that Adam had someone because God understood what it meant to have someone. The Godhead, the Trinity God, had the Father, Son, and Spirit preexistent, so forever. And they knew that's good. Like, we don't need anything else. So when I make man, the first one on the scene, who we know is Adam, God then says, it's not good that he's alone. I know what community's like, so I'm going to make him someone else. And then I'm going to make it within their system so they can keep making a, a bunch of someone else's. He knew the closeness of relationship in, in the Trinity. 
In verse 26, it's this amazing thing. When you look at it, you see that the Trinity creates community. In our image, be like us. They will reign over. I'm creating them to, to be together, to fulfill one another, and then to do something together, have a purpose. Community was key to God's heart. Which is why we, we love our, our membership class. Because it's an opportunity for people to, to be in, in, in community and in unity. It's not to add to numbers. But we want to invite people into, into the life that we get to live. And we want to be involved in people's lives. So I'm encouraging you, if, you, if you've never become a, a, a member of, of, of HCF, or maybe you're relatively new here and, and you just want to check it out. You're not required that night to become a member, but come and join us next Sunday night. I mean, we're going we're gonna to have a good time. We laugh a lot. Uh, you're going to eat good food. If you've got kids, we're going to take care of your kids. So it's date night for you or whatever it might be. But come and, and hear how God has, has formed HCF because we're his bride. We're his church. And then, and then what, we, what that means as a family of God and what that means as, a, as, as one body working together to see, to see God's design fulfilled uh, in this area where he's called us. Don't try to be a lone ranger follower of Jesus. It is not healthy and it is not in the creative process of how he intended it to be. And I mean, if you're visiting here from somewhere else and, and you have a, a church that sometimes you attend, I highly encourage you, find a place to call home. Yep. We are created to have a home, a family, a, a community and be in unity, one purpose and not being fully in charge of everything because you're not a Lone Ranger believer. You're not an island Christian. We love membership here because it's community and unity with one another. So God created us to, to know him and love him and, and show him to this world around us. And so when you read uh, Genesis, Genesis 1, you kind of see the factual, kind of the, the by the numbers part of creation. And then, and then you get into, into chapter 2 and it's kind of like this uh, expanded creativity. It's, it's, it's really kind of the same thing, just told from a different perspective. It's another vantage point of, of creation. So chapters 1 and 2 go together because they give a, a, lot, a lot of facts and then they give a lot of understanding and, and kind of creativity behind it. And, and we're not going to cover all of it. We're going to come back to it a, a little bit here, but, but we're going to dive into one part of chapter 2 today and you know, and then next week as we look at a really bad fall in chapter 3, we'll, we'll come back to verses 15 through 17 of chapter 2. Uh, they're huge and we're not overlooking it, but it has to do with the, with the tree that he planted in the garden and then the directive he gave. Uh, well, so we'll cover that in depth next Sunday. But here in chapter 2, God provides the ideal marriage. He gives us what it is. One man, one woman in a one flesh relationship for life. That's what he tells us. Four parts of the ideal in the same way that Jesus tells us as he's talking to his followers in Matthew 19. He says, hey, in the beginning, the story of, uh, of creation tells us about marriage. And I get a lot of people, especially as time has gone by over the last decade or so, and they're like, Jesus didn't talk about about this or about that, about you know, uh, marriage much or about what it really means. Come on, man. And, and I'm like, well, if Jesus said the account of creation is, is what marriage is, there you go. I mean, if, if, if Jesus said one plus one is two, you don't have to go, well, yeah, but he didn't say what seven plus three was. Because like, that's not the point. He said what one plus one was, and that's what we take. And, and I get that, that, that there are... There are things that happen along the way. And, and, and here's, here's the beauty of our redemptive, forgiving God. He's a redemptive, forgiving God. Yeah, amen. So if, if I, in humble repentance, say, God, forgive me, part of my repentance in, in asking that and being forgiven is I'm going to live different. So uh, maybe, maybe there are some and, and there's divorce in the situation or there's been a remarriage or whatever. No shame at all. God forgives. Are you living according to how the gospel calls you to live now? Because it's very clear. And, and yeah, we make mistakes, but if we come to him with a repentant heart, he forgives us. 
as long as we keep, we have, to, we have to keep living this out. Part of repentance is living out the gospel. So anything less than, or more than, or, or anything other than how Jesus describes it, how, how Genesis describes it, is, is missing the ideal design of marriage. Marriage is a man and a woman who both once lived as singular me's, coming together as a we, exclusively for life. That's the commitment we make. And no other relational bond can match the intimacy of God's divinely created union. He's saying, this is how I made it. This is how it blesses humanity. This is how it blesses the man and the woman. This is how it reflects me the best. This is the way it shows me for who I am. Genesis 2, 18 through 25. We read it. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. Now, this is just my personal uh, uh, made-up reason, but I think the reason he had Adam do it all on his own before he made Eve, can you imagine Adam and Eve trying to name all those animals together? <laughs> We'd have had the first sin before the first sin, probably. <laughs> just saying. Because it'd be like, aardvark? You really picked aardvark? You know? Okay, that's just me, and it has nothing to do with anything. But it's cool, because God calls Adam into the creative process. Like, right away. We don't know how old he was, and we don't know how long this took. Can you imagine how long that took? But he's a part of the creation process. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, the wild animals. But still, there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. Sleep. And while the man slept, the Lord took out one of the man's ribs, and then he closed up the opening. So he literally did surgery removing something. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. I mean, we kind of read that. It's just two verses and it's like, what? He built a woman out of a rib. That's why we love ribs, guys. There you go. <laughs> Figured it out. Okay, that just came to me again. Just... But he, so he, he falls into deep sleep. He does that and then says, I mean, Adam wakes up. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from the man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. See, man needs a partner in order to worship God in fullness. In marriage and even in a deeper way in community. In marriage, it's, it's because we need that and, and, and to help procreate and, and, and bring on little ones that we can raise to know Jesus, but, but we need a helper in community. We need community. We need to, to have an understanding of, of being involved in one another's lives. It's really the, the heartbeat of creation. Yes, marriage and, and a man and wife coming together, but, but then because God said, I understand the power of community, that's why I'm making a helper. Everyone needs a helper. Everyone needs that. And yet sometimes we struggle in relationships. That's why I love our ministry of Cultivate on Monday nights. I always go like this because they're over there, but Monday nights at 6, it helps us to have this, this relationship that gets healed and, and is right and is understood and we understand who we are to God. So that, that relationship is perfect and it's created and, or it helps us to, to walk in that, but then also helps us to relate with one another, to be free in relationships. And my beautiful wife is sharing her story tomorrow night. I encourage you to come and, and hear how God took a mess of our lives and he made all things new through us just going, we can't, and I don't even know if you can, but here I am. And then he's like, that's all I wanted was you submitting and let me put you on the potter's wheel and refashion you. In our lifestyle of worship and learning and submitting to God, we need others. 
We need that. That's how we're created. Not good. That's an amazing proclamation that God said. Adam was in a perfect state. He had not sinned. It was a perfect world. There was nothing wrong at all. And God said, it's not good that he's alone. Mankind was made with this need for community. Relationship that helps and fulfills. The word helper is never lesser. Uh, and I know that that gets taken out of context a lot. Helper is never lesser. It's, something, it's someone that fulfills the, the meaning. I mean, is the Holy Spirit lesser in, 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 when it comes to you and the Holy Spirit's relationship? Is he lesser in you? And he's called our helper. Eve was created and is the helper to help Adam and Eve be all that they were made to be for humanity. God made a woman to bring about the fullness of worship and, and purpose moving forward for human beings. And verse 22 isn't to be missed. It, it's a beautiful thing. We see that God kept bringing all the animals to him and, and Adam got to play a part in creation and name them all. And then when God put him to sleep and, and made woman, he brings him to Adam in this way like, look what you have now, Adam. He brought the animals by and said, do, do your job. Do your job. I like this. When he brought the woman, he's like, look, out of my most special creation, man, I have made another of my most special creation and y'all are for each other. Isn't that a good God? Amen. This father who presents his son with this intricately created gift. The best gift ever. One that God knows will please him and be cherished by him and be celebrated and they celebrate one another. And this creation is, is most special because he builds Eve out of Adam. So I built my most special out of my most special. And right here we see the establishment of marriage that Jesus refers back to. Established by God from the beginning. So Adam, dude, he's like, woo! I mean, he exclaims, it says. He's excited to say the least. And then at the end of chapter 2, it tells us that by leaving everything over here, he didn't have a father and mother, right? So, so it, it, God's pro prophesying, Adam's probably like, I don't know what you mean by leaving my father and mother. I don't, have, I don't know what that means, but God's prophesying to us by, by leaving what we had and clinging to what is made for us, we fulfill our destiny and our purpose yep. to serve and to, to worship God in this bonded total relationship. And in the same way, as individuals, we get, we get saved by Jesus. And, and then we, we leave our former selfish, self-centered, or just island lifestyles, and we cling to community. We cling to family. We cling to one body. Fully submitted to the way God saw it from the start. And if you're single, or you're single again in here, know that this is a prophetic thing as well. There's some specifics going on for Adam and Eve and for married couples and all this, but there's a, a prophecy that God is, is saying of, hey, there's a helper that I'm giving you in community, but the Holy Spirit is the ultimate helper. And he unpacks it later on in the Old Testament and specifically in the New. No matter who we are, we're called to cling to the Holy Spirit. He is our comforter and our counselor, the very presence of God in our lives. And we have a choice. The freedom is given to us to choose to live single lives or relationally intact lives the way God made it from the start. Can you stand with me? We're going to worship him one more time this morning. And, and maybe, maybe doing this song of worship, you just want to be like, wow, you are beyond my mind. I'm just going to worship you because you're so grand and big and you chose me and maybe there's some stuff you got to deal with maybe you need to choose to step into a community life and this is a good time of year I mean whether it's a resolution or just because it's 2020 or the beginning whatever it is man make sure you're part of community life a real life group a bible study the, the women's stuff's kicking off again this week and then the, the men's on Thursday or, or get your kid in youth or, or serve and give your life away there's you can serve somewhere Every day of the week up here, if you want, there's something for you. Or just in the kingdom, just giving your life away. 
but be involved in something other than you and, and, and your skewed view of, of the world and what God's called you to. Because he calls us from the very beginning to community because he said, hey, I want him to look like us, the Trinity God. I want him to, to, to understand how people can fulfill one another with, in community and, and following me. So do we trust God and his way, which is humility, or choose our own way, which is, which is pride, where we get to define how it's supposed to look? Choosing life by seeing it God's way from the start and living that out. And, and maybe you need to come up here during this song and just, just release something to the Lord or ask the Lord for something. The altars are open for you. And then after the service, we're going to have a prayer team that can, can join you in prayer for anything you have a need for. But I'm going to pray real quick and then we're going to worship him one more time this morning. And, uh, and you just give him your heart and your mind during this next song. Father God, I thank you for giving us a really good creation. For in the complexity of all it was out there as we try to take it all in, you really make it simple for us. That uh, you made us, you redeemed us, you call us to follow you and believe in you, and then you move in to our lives. And wow, it, as, as awkward as it can be out there sometimes, Lord, you make it simple for us to be fulfilled in you. I pray that if there's anybody in this room who's never made a decision to follow you, Jesus, they would right now. That they would see, well, this is a big God who had a lot going on and he thought of me. And now in the midst of me being on my own, he wants to call me into a relationship with him. And so if there's anyone in here who's never made that decision, I just pray you help them just to say yes to you, Jesus. Trade their life for all that you are. And Holy Spirit, you would move in right now at salvation. If there's anyone in this room who's, who needs to come back and make a decision or a recommitment or rededication, I pray that they would, they would know that you are so excited that they've returned, like that father looking at his prodigal son coming a long way off and he ran to him in joy to celebrate him because you are truly relentless in your pursuit in love for us and for all of us who call you Savior and King, Jesus, I pray that we would worship you with absolute whole hearts right now. One more time. In your name we pray. Amen.